Hello and welcome to a talk about the LibreSoc Hybrid S3D CPU GPU VPU. Um, with many thanks to uh, FOSDEM organizers and also to the Open Power Foundation for this opportunity. Um, and also, <laughs> really a huge thank you to um, NLNet for uh, sponsoring this project um, in such a big way. So, um, what we're going to go over in this uh, talk is um, the basics of why we're doing a, an SOC in the first place. Um, and the, the background here is that uh, I've been um, involved in hardware uh, design and looking for you know, a properly responsible ethical SOC that has the modern features that you'd expect of mass volume things, you know, a Samsung smartphone. And um, after 10 years, I got absolutely fed up with it. Um, this, um, you've got the Intel management engine, which has been in um, uh, Intel processors since 2009. Uh, AMD has their own equivalent since 2013. Um, you've got Apple QA issues were detected by Intel they were reporting more QA issues in Intel processors than Intel were reporting in Intel's Intel processors, uh, which is why they started the M1 project. Um, you've got Spectre, you've got Meltdown, you've, it's just a mess. Um, uh, thing. You've got endless proprietary drivers. Yes, the simplest solution for hardware vendors um, is to license, you know, for your average fabulous semiconductor company, all winner, rock chip, AM Logic, um, Texas Instruments, Freescale, they license proprietary hard macros. And usually these come with proprietary firmware that was developed by a third party where they forgot to engage, they get any kind of licensing agreement and ownership over the base thing. And this is what happened in the... Uh, in Mali 400 and in uh, Qual no, uh, I think it was Qualcomm, um, uh, no, Broadcom Video Core 5 GPU. Um, because it Broadcom's GPU is based on Arc, Arc owns the licenses on the header files. They can't give the source code of the um, of the firmware in order for Raspberry Pis to be able to boot. And they've got to rely, critically rely, on sponge off of free software developers to perform reverse engineering. They don't bother to pay anybody for it. Or say thank you, you know, but hey. Anyway, um, these hard, you know, proprietary firmware obviously affects product development costs due to peak driver bugs and this hit in particular with the Samsung S3C6410 which had uh, not very many people know of it was um, uh, it had its own GPU and the what was it to get it right the if you called the OpenGL initialization uh, functions in exactly the right order, there was no problem. If, however, your Android application happened to initialize it in, the, in call these functions in the, a different order, you got a seg fault, and there's no reason, no explanation as to why. Right? And investigating that is flat out impossible. You just you can't do it because you don't have the source code. And this was highlighted um, very very clearly by the Intel and Valve Steam collaboration which was <laughs> if you look at the the uh, blog post they say it was literally the most productive business meeting they'd ever had um, and it comes down to the fact that they were able you know the Intel developers not the management not the directors not the lawyers were able to arrange uh, a, a meeting uh, a, um, you know, they just got permission, they went off and met up, and they were able to single step through each other's code bases with no NDAs. That is deeply significant, right? Um, you know, it, you, people, you know, from Fuzzwem, we get this, this stuff, but it, it hasn't made it through 
to the fabulous semiconductors. No fabulous semiconductor company has ever put their foot down and said, I'm sorry, your proprietary firmware isn't good enough. We're going to reject it and find another way. They go, oh, um, we just want to make money from selling chips. Um, that will do. <laughs> right. um, so it, ultimately, all of this stems from a strategic business objective to develop entirely Libra hardware, firmware and drivers so that we can go to companies and say this use our chip. It will be easier for you to develop. It will cost you less money to develop your product. So why are we using open power? Well, <laughs> to it, as I just said, you know, we, we, everything has to be labor and transparent um, for business reasons, not because we're some wannabe, you know, uh, woo thing. It's all free and open. Um, no, it's business objectives. So a good ecosystem is essential. You have to have Linux kernel, U-boot compilers, the operating systems, reference implementations, everything, and that's available with Open Power. We need a supportive foundation of members, um, and I tell you, they, they, um, the Open Power Foundation have been absolutely fantastic about this. Um, uh, thanks to um, people like Hugh Blemings, uh, Paul McCarris, uh, Mendy, um, uh, Toshira Bashan, um, uh, James Kalina, they've been really supportive. Um, we need to be able to submit uh, instruction set augmentations because um, we're doing this. We're, we're, we're not. I'll explain it later. And saying we're not messing about. We're doing actual augmentation of the Open Power instruction set, and we need to be able to submit and uh, uh, augmentations for proper proper review. But we also need peer review, transparent peer review, in order to accelerate the process of development. Um, we need to not be under any NDAs, and we need other people to not be under any NDAs either. Full transparency must, must be acceptable due to being funded under NLNet's Privacy and Enhanced Trust Program, but also so that we can engage with uh, professionals the world over who support the entire concept of open source and, and, and Libra, etc., etc., um, who are they're not going to sign a, an NDA or sign some agreement just to get access to a mailing list in order to give us advice advice on on how things you know, on mistakes that we're making. Um, they're going to want to see everything right there, right then, in order to be help. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, Risk Five Foundation has these closed uh, closed processes that prevented and prevented us from participating. Um, Open Power has been established for decades. It's an excellent foundation. Um, uh, Microwatt has been a hugely valuable um, reference um, for us, and the team have been hugely approachable and friendly. So that's yeah, it. Just makes sense. How can you help? Um, I mean, this is fast M talks. So, you know, how can you help? You can start with the mailing list, um, hdbslibrasoc.org. Um, the mailing lists are at um, yes, list.librasoc.org. We've got a, a free no channel, Librasoc, etc., etc. It's you know, it's a Libra project. Go figure. Um, uh, we specifically run um, under um, uh, full transparency as far as actual development is concerned. Uh, we do request that you engage with people through the um, through, through the resources that um, can be audited in the future um, and please don't do I'll commit it when it's ready I'll commit it when it's finished it's just you know, it, that's not collaboration um, uh, 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 you, you become a single point of failure in the in the project and if you get hit by the your proverbial uh, Torvalds bus um, everything you develop privately we have to redo so um, you know, is standard Libra project fair? fair. Uh, can you get paid for this? Yes, you can. Um, it's NLF funded. Um, we do get some very weird questions. So I've gone over those in the FAQ. So see Libra.org slash NLNet slash hash FAQ uh, for that. Um, also, um, what we're doing is we're doing profit sharing in any commercial ventures. So, uh, you know, pro rata, your contributions um, uh, uh, will result in you actually receiving some um, uh, so, so some money um, for, for, for that one. You know, if we, if we sell 100 million chips, you'll get a share of that. Way. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to put this. 
how many opportunities to develop Libra SOCs exist and actually get paid for it? <laughs> um, even if you're not a developer, there is still ways that you can help. There's plenty of research needed um, uh, uh, for things, you know, just finding things on the internet and documenting and putting them on the bug tracker on the wiki. Um, there's artwork that needs to be doing, there's websites and things in the wiki. Um, we also need help finding customers and OEMs willing to commit. Now, right now, we're um, currently um, looking at um, uh, for investors and um, putting a business plan together. Um, we need to find customers willing to sign a letter of intent um, that we can put into the uh, business plan. Uh, we have two already. Um, we need three more really um, and then um, uh, actually putting this into a, a quad core chip and got a, a quad core processor um, is uh, pretty straightforward from that point onwards. What actually goes into a typical SOC? Um, you usually now, now the point is this is power. Open power is traditionally known for like 200 watt IBM power line cores. Um, the embedded uh, processors, um, 300 megahertz, these do exist um, usually in the uh, aerospace industry, um, uh, and there is a uh, one going end of life called the Quarrel, <laughs> which is a power 2.08 uh, processor. Um, we're at the completely different market. This completely missing um, uh, market, uh, which which is basically a Raspberry Pi style processor or you know, a smartphone, ne um, netbook, Chromebook, etc. Um, and those are typically 15 to 20 millimeter BGA, FBGA packages, um, two and a half to five watt power consumption, which means the heatsink is not normally required, which simplifies your overall design. Um, it reduces the cost of you know the actual products. Um, you've seen the latest Raspberry Pi 4s. They require a heatsink and a fan. I mean, you know, that's that's not very sensible. Um, that's a point of failure when you're in a, a thing. Um, you get, unlike Intel processors, you have fully integrated peripherals. There is no North Bridge and South Bridge chip. I, it is one chip. Everything is on the one chip. USB, HDMI, RGB, TTL, uh, microSD, I2C, UART, the usual stuff um, that you see. Um, uh, there is no separate GPU. It, with, it, typically, that um, on SOCs, you have a shared memory bus rather than a PCI Express uh, bus. You have a shared memory uh, bus, and um, uh, 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 it's a separate instruction set, a totally separate core. We are doing a uh, so that's so that's how the typical one is. Um, there is a GPU, but it's on a shared memory bus. And likewise, there's, there's typically a proprietary built-in VPU, which is both the GPU and the VPU are typically licensed as set completely separate hard macros. So Vivant GC800, GC1000, 2000, uh, PowerVR, Mali, etc., etc., et um, and that's where. You, Problems start for um, uh, for for, um, for transparency. Um, your target price is between two dollars fifty and thirty, depending on the market. Um, uh, 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 the Ingenic JZ JZ four seven seven five is the two dollars fifty mark, um, and by the time you get to quad core IMX six. Uh, uh, Freescale uh, NXP, you're looking at about $36, um, and that's the typical uh, typical amount that um, your Texas Instruments, um, OMAPs, and etc. etc. are priced at as well. Um, but we're doing the same thing, but just with a hybrid and transparent architecture, where the CPU equals the GPU equals the VPU, and that's radically different proposition. Anyway, quick, lovely, pretty diagram. Um, uh, you, you, you can see uh, the thing with I uh, you, you've got the, the core here. Um, that's your main core. Uh, you've got an axial wishbone bus. You've got an IO MMU to protect the uh, peripherals from, you know, from from a, from, a, from attack. Um, but you've got the usual stuff that you would see on a Raspberry Pi style processor and, 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 and a thing, right? And um, you know, you. you uh, DDR3, DDR4, and um, uh, JEDEC uh, Hyper RAM uh, as, as well. Right. So what's the di difference about LibreSock? It's a hybrid integrated processor. Right. The CPU is the GPU. The GPU 
is the CPU. The VPU is the CPU. There is no separate VPU, GPU, pipeline or processor. I'm sorry if I have to emphasize this, but we're getting a lot of people going, oh, so you're doing a GPU. Uh, great. Um, you know, uh, uh, can it, they, 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 they seem to think because the current incumbent market creates completely separate GPUs that we're doing a, a, a completely separate GPU that's incapable of doing C standard workloads. It's not. We're doing, a, 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 it's a full integrated hybrid approach. Um, it's written in Namijen, which is a very unusual cho choice. Um, it's a Python-based HDL. Um, we are not doing VHDL or Verilog. It is similar to the Chisel concept, um, but not exactly. Um, but it's an extremely important strategic decision, given that 30% um, of programmers in the world know Python. Um, so we're doing an extension i've done i'll be doing a separate talk about this we're doing something called a simple v vector extension um and the reason for that comes down to an article um by the um, founders of risk five um about cray style vectors um called simd considered harmful um and simple v is effectively a hardware for loop on standard scalar instructions um conceptually similar to um, zero overhead loops in dsps which is about the closest thing that it that it uh that it is uh, similar to um thing but uh, it's as it's effectively a zero overhead loop on a single instruction not a group of instructions as is done for example in the texas instruments dsps um well, great, but you know, if I'm going to compare this against Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, ARM, and, and, and IBM, what's different about that? So what we're now going to do is go into a little bit about the background of the different uh, processes, um, the thing in different markets. So the first one is the um, open power cell processor um, uh, and upwards. So the open power instruction set actually developed from PowerPC originally with the RS6000 being the first commercial version in the, in the early 90s. Following on from that success, Sony, IBM, and Toshiba got together and created the cell processor in 2001. Um, that resulted in the Sony PlayStation, and it's a non-uniform uh, NUMA approach. Um, it's there's a lowly standard power instruction set compliant core, and then these uh, NUMA massive uh, uh, um, uh, raw brute force computation um, engines that run a subset of the power instruction set um, uh, and they used DMA engines to communicate between the two so you'd have 16 of these cells uh, with the subset processors going on, on DMA and you'd have to hand the workload a bit of a pain in the neck to program um, uh, and it's one of the re reasons why um, we're doing SMP symmetric multiprocessing um, on the thing um, in terms of raw brute performance, though, it pissed all over the competition at the time. Um, but uh, one important thing that we learned from uh, Jeff Bush here is that, uh, with his work on Nyusi, is that uh, raw brute performance, perform, uh, brute force uh, computation performance, competitively these days, isn't good enough. If you want to do a GPU, you need to be efficient. And when I talked to Jeff, um, he explained to me that, uh, and we calcul calculated that uh, the power consumption of the approach that he took, the software only rendering approach that he took, would require four times the silicon, and therefore four times the amount of power, to keep up with a modern GPU of the same uh, same level. So you'd either have the same silicon and power consumption, but 25% of the performance, or you'd have to do, if you wanted the same performance, you'd have to have put in four times the silicon, four times the power, and that would be commercially slated. You can't do it. Not today. All right. Uh, VSX later evolved out of this uh, the the, um, the cell uh, processor initiative. Um, unfortunately, VSX, which is a SIMD extension, it is not a vector system. It is SIMD. 
um, is now showing its age. Um, it's fixed width. There is no predication. Um, so it, again, if you look at the simply considered harmful approach, it, it, it applies to VSX, unfortunately. It does not have predication, which is critically important for 3D. Um, and it has limited pixel formats. Um, it has one 15-bit or 16-bit um, uh, pixel conversion thing. And Vulkan requires does requires dozens of hard pixel formats. Now you can do those in software, but again, if you do it exclusively in software, you end up with performance that sucks and commercially it's not going to be acceptable. So we have to add these instructions in hardware the support for these um, for the modern concepts and that's what the, that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing now there was a very interesting article on medium.com um, uh, about the apple m1 when it came out um, the m1 it turns out does multi-issue out of order execution i mean it's it's enormous it's as big as the power 10 um in in its um, a thing but here's the thing apple uses um the arm instruction and intel implements x86 so apple's does risk multi-issue intel does six multi-issue now that doesn't sound very significant until you realize that the decoder of an ARM processor when you are identifying the length of the instruction, the start of the instruction. Remember, you have to do this in one cycle. You have to identify four, six, eight, whatever, however instructions in one cycle. And the Intel processors, because the instructions vary between 16 and 128 bits, you have to start the identification process at every single freaking byte and cancel it, <laughs> cancel some of them when you've identified just the length of the instruction. And then finally you pass those instructions. You haven't decoded them fully. You've just identified the length. You then pass them through to multi-issue parallel engines, and that's where your multi-issue actually starts. But if you can't identify the start of the fricking instruction, you can't feed the instructions to the parallel execution engines. And because ARM's instruction length identification is so simple, because it is RISC, the Apple M1 can keep the its internal parallel backend execution engine engines 100% occupied and intel cannot all right now open power happens also to be risk um, it used to be 32 bit only which is dead simple all right but now they've gone to uh, 64 bit but you can use a um, of type of uh, an adaptation of carry look ahead um, to still identify the start of the instructions and consequently this is why power 10 has eight way multi issue it's a monster I right, just like the m1 I right, and that and that um, those execution engines those eight execution engines can be kept 100% occupied right, whereas in in x86 they'll be lucky if they get four instructions at the, at the decode phase right so Librasoft can do these same tricks that IBM power 10 um, and Apple m1 can but Intel x86 literally cannot keep up the other thing that we're doing is we're, we've gone back in time to 1965 basing our, our, uh, what we're doing on the CDC 6600 which if you look up you can find the description of this in a book called Design of a Computer by uh, James Thornton um, it's freely available online because bless him uh, uh, James Thornton's wife gave permission for this to be published um, in, the, in the public domain um, it's a really poignant and really beautiful thing of what, he's, what, they, what he, 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 he gave permission to do um, but the, here's the thing is whilst the design uh, the 6600 is from 1965 the augmentations that we've learned for, uh, um, are from Mitch Alsop are not 
Mitch also has helped us to add precise exceptions, multi-issue, and much, much more. Um, and um, his interest was because he's basically pissed off um, with the m misconceptions that have been um, uh, have been spread uh, by the academic con community um, about um, about the 6600. And he was delighted um, to be you know to for, to to reach out to him um, and to get in touch with him. No NDI sign, no NDA signed. Remember, um, yeah, um, uh, and basically the 6600 score was completely misunder misunderstood and misunderstood. Um, a result of the, using them is that we can greatly simplify the internal architecture. All right, and a small team can manage this. Now, um, by using um, Vec Cray style vectors, we've got a front end vector instruction set with a back end predicated or masked SIMD uh, 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 um, uh, ALUs, um, which um, because of the 6600 style thing, we don't have to worry about the um, the uh, scheduling because the 6600 deals with the out of order execution for us. Um, at, in the predicated mass SIMD, Namigen turned out to be strategically critical, absolutely critical to achieving this. And we'll go into a little bit of that. We've got time in, in, a, in, a, in a bit. Um, so uh, uh, out of order execution combined with simple V allows scalar operations at the developer end to be turned into SIMD at the back end without the developer needing to do or know SIMD. And that is critically important to drastically simplifying the um, the assembly level and compiler level programming. On top of this, we're then going to add um, uh, IEEE 754 sine, cosine, 8 and 2, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that you need for 3, 3D. Texturization opcodes, YUV to RGB, um, Vulkan um, uh, pixel formats, etc. Um, all of which become vectorized through the simple V instruction set, the simple V context. So putting all these together, um, Apple, the M1 and the Power 10 show that RISC plus Superscalar multi-issue produces insane performance. Um, Intel AVX 512 and CISC in general is getting out of hand. You know, your next thing is going to be they're at, they'll have to add 256-bit length instructions, and they'll have to add AVX 1024, um, and they'll, the 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 they've already the, there was a fascinating talk um, by Tim Forsyth which showed um, that they have. Uh, the distance between the vector unit, the AVX512 unit, and the main scalar processor so far that they're getting um, latency problems in instruction um, execution. Um, so every time you execute an AVX512 instruction, you get a huge delay because it has to, the internal architecture has to stop what it's doing at the scalar level make sure everything's up to speed and then oh uh, uh, we're going to chuck it at chuck it at the uh, avx uh, 512 and then once that's done uh, synchronize back up again it's like oh god <laughs> um risk five rvv shows cray style vectors can save power this is one thing that was not picked up has not really been picked up on as being deeply significant of that simply considered harmful um um uh, um uh, article um, it the bang per buck on the instructions you can have your vector instruction issue 32 or 64 or however many um, vector elements there, there are to the back end ALUs and then sit there and twiddle its thumbs and consequently that you know whilst it's screaming at the back end on you know, uh, doing computations and consequently you get f a far higher bang per buck and you need to execute less instructions to do it that means so especially in your decoder um, and your multi-issue engine it's idle it's not consuming power you've also reduced instruction cache usage all right um, but um, the other thing is that um, SimpleV has the same benefits as RISC-V vectors, but with far less instructions actually added. The SIMD instruct considered harmful principles that apply to um, SIMD also apply to RISC-V vectors and vector instructions in general. 
and we um, uh, did something completely different. I'll go into detail in the in, the, in this other talk. Um, CDC 600 shows that intelligently implemented diets can do the job with far less resources consumed, both in the development and when it's actually in production. So, Libresoc combines the best of historical processes designs, co-opting and innovating on them, and pissing in the backyard of every incumbent CPU and GPU company in the process. Um, it's a Libra project, so you get to help do that. So, why are we using Nimigen? Um, we can use Python to build an abstract syntax tree, um, which then in, in memory for explicitly with, with Python, whereas with Verilog and VHDL um, and MyHDL, you're actually, it's the, the language is the expression of the, um, the HDL. Whereas um, it, it, with, with Namigen, you're in Python constructing the in memory HDL using Python classes and objects. And then those that in-memory representation is handed over to uh, Yosis to create an Ilang file um, or RTLIL. Um, after which you can then convert that to Verilog if you need if you need to. Uh, Namijan has deterministic synthesizer behavior. Um, uh, signals to clear with a reset pattern. Uh, you know, you no more forgetting if you created a reset block. Um, uh, uh, yeah, you, it, it, that just doesn't happen because it, the, when you declare the signal, it automatically, if you don't specify the reset argument, it's false to zero. And then it automatically generates the ilang-verilog for you containing that reset. Um, we can apply Python object-oriented programming techniques. So classes and functions created uh, can be created, which pass in parameters, which change what HDL is actually created. And what we think now, you can do exactly the same thing with uh, VHDL and Verilog, but nowhere near the extent to which we're doing it in in um, in the MeGen. Um, you cannot do um, multiple inheritance in Verilog, for example. Um, uh, so, the the other thing is that we can do Python-based for loops, so we can read CSV files that generate a hierarchical nested suite of switch statements, HDL switch statements, um, which is how the LibreSoc um, Power Instruction Decoder is implemented. And I really just wanted to go over that um, and, and thing. So, um, here here is the microwatt uh, decoder um, decode one for the Open Power Instruction set, and um, what they've done is they've declared this, um, it's a micro-coded like um, thing where um, um, here is the major opcode and major opcode 12 is an add operation uh, and it is a signed immediate, const underscore si is a signed immediate. Okay, all right, so you get the idea. You've got all these tables, okay, all right. So, um, and then um, there's one for opcode four. Major, uh, major opcode four has some minor opcode decoding here, all right, in this first column, and so on and so forth. So this is the for the minor 19. This is the one for opcode 30, opcode 31. That's a huge number of things. So what we decided to do instead was to take these, and I, I literally cut and paste them, and created CSV files instead. So where, um, uh, 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 where microwatt major has this structure of type uh, major ROM array underscore T, um, we instead have a CSV file with a line where the opcodes the uh, um, uh, column is 12, 12, the unit is ALU, the, it's an add, it's, oh, and there's your constant SI, so your second input is a signed uh, immediate, etc., etc. Now, ready for that, Viz? Okay. So here's the, um, the actual power decoder. Okay, all right, and if I scroll all the way to the bottom, 
you can see a function opcodes equals get underscore csv here. So that loads the minor nine underscore 19 CSV file, but it hands it, um, it creates a Python list containing a class sub decoder where this pattern here, for example, so for example, pattern equals 19 says when you recognize opcode 19 in the major, in the top decoder, please perform further sub decoding recursively are uh, using the minor 19 CSV file. So your first one has a, uh, where's the major one? Here's the major CSV, okay, all right. Here's the major CSV, so the, that's the first level. And then it goes recursively down the thing. Now, um, if you start looking through this code, it actually is incredibly difficult to spot where the bits of the actual Namigen are. All right, so I'm going to do a search signal. Oh, look, there's one there at a line 187. Remember, this is a 600 line file. So there's one occurrence of signal there, one at line 196, one at line 303, one at 339. I mean, it's nothing. All right. Um, oh, here's a case statement. Okay, but can you see, we've done a, a, rather than, let's go back to the micro one here. Okay, um, uh, the normal way that you would do this is you would lay it out with a massive series of switch and case statements. Um, but here, oh, here we go. Here's your, here's your top level um, case statement here, line 565 in microwatts decode1.vhdl. Case to inch of the major op, when for, do further decoding when 31 do further decoding etc so when 16 18 etc what we're doing is a for loop over the switch statements here we're starting the actual namigen switch statement here and enumerating individual cases of the list can you see so um uh, and, and, and because it's recursive, it, it divorces the thing. Now, the advantage is that these CSV files, we can then use these to create documentation, just exactly as we've done here. We can use it to generate other parsers. We can use it to, in the simulators and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, and it, it's all from that single from these single files so we don't end up with transcription errors um, uh, which would normally be seen um, I think and it hugely reduces the amount of work um, I think these are software engineering techniques nobody's really applying software engineering techniques to um, to hardware um, and the microwatt team or one of the other people one of the other teams that have applied this because Anton Blanchard trained changes the software engineer so, um, going back to the uh, thing. Um, so yes, the, the, we, these hierarchical nested um, suite of, of HDL switch statements, um, uh, uh, we can think with very little code, and it's written in, in written in Python. You, it's the whole point is to is to leverage the power of Python rather than um, be stuck in uh, uh, what is, you know, effectively uh, the, the, the software engineering equivalent of programming in Fortran and a basic. Um, this extreme object-oriented abstraction can be even used to create dynamic partition signals that have same operator overloaded add, subtract, and greater than operators that you normally see in Python code. Um, uh, again, I just want to, to briefly go over the, over this uh, with you. Here is our dynamic partition signal class. Um, this is our SIMD, SIMD class. And, um, oh look, there's an underscore, underscore, and operator, which is the standard thing where if you do um, X and B, uh, X and Y, it calls underscore underscore and for you and we are critically relying on that capability in Python. Namijan already does this um, but it does it in um, uh, a um, um, for a signal only and we're doing it in, in this dynamic partition signal. So 
Um, uh, to explain a little bit about that, um, the dynamic partition things, here uh, is an illustration on our, our, our wiki of uh, uh, you've got a partition, a three-bit partition, but you've got A broken down, A and B broken down. So the partition bit divides. So if this is set to, if this bit here is set to one, it breaks it down into two, two 16-bit integers. And we worked out how to use carry to propagate over the partition boundary into the next signal and then um, so that you could break it down into 8 times 8, uh, 4 times 16, 2 times 32 or 1 times 64 in the same hardware. We are not doing separate 64 bit, separate 2 times 32, separate one, 4 times uh, 16 and separate 8 times 8 hardware. Right. It's in the same thing. And then adding through the Python ob uh, OO abstraction of Namigen, making it look like it's an ordinary signal. So um, that's... You, 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 <laughs> try that in Verilog of the HDL. Um, so uh, if you just go over the um, what symbol D, why have we done another vector instruction set, um, or not exactly another one? Um, it's a it's a it's a tagging system. It's um, the, the, uh, I do go over this more more in detail in the in the other talk. Um, it we are not adding vector opcodes. We are adding a tagging system tagging system, and, and it's a context on top of the scalar operations. Um, so uh, the the Sim, VSX SIMD um, uh, uh, instruction set in, in open power is another 700 opcodes. Um, that, the number of gates involved in that is enormous um, uh, 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 thing. So it would unlikely to fit it into a single clock cycle. So we're just not, we're, we're not going to do it. Um, a simple V effectively is a hardware sub counter for loop which pauses the program counter and rolls through the register numbers sequentially, issuing multiple scalar instructions into the pipelines. And this is the critical reason why we're doing a multi-issue out-of-order microarchitecture. Current and future power and open power instruction instruction scalar opcodes inherently and automatically become vectorized, which is extremely important for, for academic research as well as for um, uh, commercial reasons. Is you don't want to to, to go through the rigmarole of adding a scalar instruction and adding a vector instruction. You just add it to scalar and it's automatically and inherently vector vectorized. So uh, that predication and element with polymorphism are also context or tags. So um, this allows us to do BF16, FB16, uh, 128, be added to the instruction set without modifying the instruction set. It's a paradox. You add things to the instruction set without adding things to the instruction set because it's inherently already there. Um, yeah, thing. And this saves huge on the thing. So um, the 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 summary on SIMD is that it's very instrument and, sub uh, and seductive. Um, the parallelism is in the ALU, um, but it's, you have to sit, read the article SIMD considered har har harmful. Uh, the corner cases setup is extremely complex, and <laughs> sad to say, the the VSX patch for Power 9 for Strinner copy is a whopping 250 handwritten assembly lines, whereas for RVV and Simple V, Strinner copy is 14 one four instructions. No setup and tear down corner cases required. Um, uh, SIMD is an order into the six opcode proliferation. Thousands of instructions. All right. Um, so this is simply in a nutshell. Um, you can see here, here that um, uh, the th that's that's your uh, um, that's your add operation, but you increment the source and destination registers by one each time you go around the loop. Um, we've also um, we're adding um, uh, SVE2 was the first one, an ARM was the first place to really uh, introduce uh, data dependent fail on first. Um, we've added a uh, sorry fail on first uh, for load and store, um, but we've added data dependent fail on first as well. It's also a new concept called twin predication, um, where you have a predicate on the source 
as it completely independently of the predicate on the destination. And this basically means that we have um, back to back gather and scatter, which results in something um, uh, V, uh, it's a multi V insert multiple ordered v insert uh, um uh, uh, yeah uh, thing um so, uh, again this is in the simple v um uh, um, um talk um svp64 is an extensive tagging uh, vector context augmentation system uh, which is context propagation so it's a bit like vliw but um uh, 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 is a, a second secondary system on top of svp64 which allows you to repeatedly apply those contexts and it's effectively a hardware compression algorithm for instruction sets. Um, ultimate goal here is to cut down on instruction cache usage and therefore to cut down on power, um, where a, uh, a, a typical GPU would have its own instruction cache and small shaders with, we're high, because we're doing a hybrid CPU GPU, the instruction cache is not separate, it is the same instruction cache. Um, but the thing about this thing is, bear in mind, cavities, all of this still needs to go through Open Power Foundation for ratification and approval. So, um, our summary goal here is to produce a mass volume, low power embedded system on chips suitable for use in netbooks, smartbooks, Chromebooks, tablets, blah, 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 Raspberry Pis, etc., single board computers. Um, there's no way that we could do this without um, a project of this magnitude without NumiGen being able to use uh, Python out of order um, to, to, to create the HDL. Um, Collaboration with the Open Power Foundation and members is absolutely essential. There are no shortcuts here because of the, the, the transparency that's required. Um, the standards are to be developed and ratified so that everyone benefits. Um, and we're riding the wave of the huge stability from two decades of uh, the Open Power ecosystem. Um, and the greatly simplified um, uh, 3D and video drivers reduces product development costs for customers, and that's very important as part of for part of the business plan this sort of thing. Um, it just also happens to be fascinating, deep rewarding, technically challenging, and fun actually funded by LLED, <laughs> which is great. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. Any questions? So I'll take them in the the chat. Thank you.